Thank you everyone for coming today. The event is a keynote address of the 2019 Blockchain, FinTech, and the Law Conference at Harvard Law School. Um, we are very pleased to have Gary Gensler with us today as our keynote speaker. So Gary served as the chair of the Commodities Future Trading Commission from 2009 to 2014, leading the Obama administration's post-crisis reform efforts of the $400 trillion over-the-counter derivatives market. He is currently senior advisor to the director of the MIT Media Lab and a senior lecturer at the MIT Sloan School of Management. As part of MIT's Digital Currency Initiative, Gary lectures students on blockchain technologies and cryptocurrencies. Gary has worked on various political campaigns, most recently as the CFO of Hillary Clinton's 2016 presidential campaign. He was a senior advisor to Hillary Clinton's 2008 campaign and subsequently an economic advisor for the Obama 2008 campaign. Prior to his public service, Gary worked at Goldman Sachs from 1979 to 1997, having become a partner in the mergers and acquisitions department. Gary earned his undergraduate degree in economics in 1978 from the University of Pennsylvania and his MBA from the Wharton School at the University of Pennsylvania. Um, so finally, this event is being recorded. So without further ado, Gary Gensler. Please give a warm welcome for Gary Gensler. Um. Thank you, Elizabeth, for that kind introduction. Thank you for the, let me remember, it's called Blockchain and FinTech Initiative Club? Just, just initiative. initiative. All right, it's even bolder. It's just initiative. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Harvard Law, for hosting this. Uh, you were kind to say my resume and everything. One thing you left out is that in 1979, I applied. How many people here are Harvard Law students? All right, you all have done something I couldn't do, because in 1979, exactly 40 years ago, I applied to and got denied acceptance to Harvard Law and chose instead to go to Goldman Sachs. Um, I turned down a fancy law school in the West. Stanford did accept me. I didn't go. But life treated me fine. Um, I'm going to chat. I teach over at MIT now. I'm very involved in finance and fintech and blockchain technology. Um, I'm going to talk about blockchain technology because it's a law school. I will be chatting about the law as well. I don't know how to get that uh, down. There we go. There we go. Um, and there we go. All right. I know I can do it. Um, so I'm going to try to cover a few topics. First, blockchain technology and money and how it fits into money. And that's just kind of a fun grounding of this subject. Um, then just a little bit about, because your club is, initiative has fintech in it, just finance and fintech. And what, what, what does that mean, just to bring it together? I, I promise you, I will get to the law, but I thought, you know, just a little bit about money and fintech before that. And then the markets, crypto finance. What do the crypto exchanges uh, look like? What are the sectors in this market? It's about $175 billion asset class right now, but what's what's involved in that asset class, and where do these, these assets trade. And then really then talk about the public policy frameworks. Because I think this, uh, this space is in the midst of its third hype cycle. I want to talk about the first two and the third hype cycle uh, uh, to close it out. So that's what I'm going to try to do. I'm glad to take questions of going throughout. You're eating lunch, uh, dinner. Elizabeth tells me to save time at the end for questions, but I'm glad to take it at, at any point in time as we go. So that's what I'm going to try to cover. So first, on Halloween, Halloween night, just 10 and a half years ago, Satoshi Nakamoto wrote this and started an email with this sentence on a cypherpunk mailing list. That is actually cypherpunk. It was a cryptographer's mailing list, and I am working on a new electronic cash system that's peer-to-peer, -peer, no central authority in essence. That's this initiative. Now I start with just a stage setting. Does anybody in the room know who Satoshi Nakamoto is? Oh, please, please, we're recording you and we're gonna find out. Who? Who's Satoshi Nakamoto? Um, well, he's basically the creator of the yeah, we, we know that. Who is she? Uh, uh, or he? The person? Yeah. He's yet to be caught. Oh, yet to be caught. All right. So I ask every audience because I'm waiting for somebody in some audience to tell us. But it's sort of a nice foundational story that we don't actually know who the inventor is. I mean, whoever she is or he is. 
has chosen not to reveal themselves at all, or if it was a committee. But it started with this concept. So what does this mean, and where do we go from this? Well, a little thought about money, because that's what Satoshi Nakamoto was trying to do, was something about money. Money has three roles, uh, economists and anthropologists and even archaeologists debate what was its initial role, whether a medium of exchange or, or a store of value. Uh, it certainly took on quickly a, a unit of account as well. But these three principal roles of money. So I'm going to hand out a little bit of money here. Now, you're not going to get all of them, but you know, everybody's eating here. You look like you want some money. <laughs> yeah, yeah, all right. I don't want to say that I'm only favoring the left-hand side or only favoring women or anything like that. But here, pass some of this around. So, um, oh, here I am. I think I'm done. Oh, that's, that's a lousy piece of money there. It's uncovered. So would you, would you accept that? Would somebody take that from you as a unit of account, medium of exchange, or a store of value? What I just handed. Anybody? Chocolate wouldn't do it for you? <laughs> I hand it out for those who didn't see chocolate Bitcoin. You know, it's, it, they, you can eat them. It, it goes with the dinner. So you wouldn't take it because why? You wouldn't take it because the rest of your <coughs> classmates wouldn't take it? it. It's not. Money is just a social construct. Money is an invention of thousands of years ago by humans. There's no natural law that says there's money. It's actually the first fintech to talk about financial technology. In fact, here's some early money. And if we had more time, we could talk about each one of these. All of these, these physical representations of money, and the, and the I can't remember what I put up, the, the, the bronze and the, the, the gold the coins from Rome and so forth actually predate the cowrie shells of West Africa or or the Yap Stone, which is actually the rye stones on the island of Yap, um, all forms of money. But they're just a social construct. And what I'm going to contend is blockchain technology underlying what Satoshi Nakamoto is trying to do was to form a new form of money, kind of a private sector money to compete with other forms of money. But all of these have been money at one point in time. And, um, but then we know something called fiat currency. Back to uh, the paper, uh, on the bottom left-hand corner, about seven or 800 years ago, money started to take the form of paper in certain circumstances. And those circumstances were warehouse receipts. And anybody here who goes into commodities law, I can assure you, in a narrow niche of what you'll do, <coughs> you will study warehouse receipts. When I shared the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, I had to learn about them. That is, you put something in a warehouse, and now you have a receipt. And you can put corn, grain, gold, copper, anything in a warehouse and have a receipt. And guess what you can do with that receipt? You can actually take that piece of paper and borrow against it. You can use it to finance things. And in fact, some of the first commercial banks were goldsmiths because they were taking warehouse receipts for gold. Well, on the bottom left on this is about seven or 800 years ago in China, a warehouse receipt. Why would you use warehouse receipts rather than gold or silver? Because it's more portable. It's easier to chart around and things like that. And even today, in 2019, you can finance against warehouse receipts. And some of you somewhere will be at Sullivan and Cromwell studying this and doing it, but uh, um, not many of you probably. Um, fiat currency grew out of that. Fiat currency is what? It's basically the sovereign issuing something that's a socially acceptable form of money. Now, in fact, we now know that, now watch this, watch this. I'm guessing that if I hand you this, will you take it? Sure. Right? You would give something for that. You can keep it for a while. <laughs> Right? So we're going to ask a couple of questions. What does it say on the top of it, on the front? Front, uh, Federal Reserve note, the United States of America. This is not legal. This is, no, is legal tender. <laughs> okay. So what does it mean to say it's a Federal Reserve note? Have you taken corporate law yet? 
or are you a business student? Uh, I'm I'm actually a recent graduate. You're a recent graduate law of a law school. So of this law school? Yes. Oh, fine law school. So did you take corporate law? I did. Yeah. So what is this? <laughs> what is this in relation to the Federal Reserve? Um, it is a. I guess it's a. Could be considered a contract. Agreement. All right. It's a contract, right? What is, what side of the balance sheet is it on? We all carry it's an around. Asset. What's that? It's an asset. All right, there. I've got one person for asset. Anybody want to go? Uh, it's the bank's liability. It's a bank liability. So it's actually debt of the Federal Reserve. $1.8, $1.7 trillion of liabilities of the U.S. Federal Reserve right now as we sit here. We have a $20 trillion economy, and, and our cash in circulation is about 7 or 8% of our uh, economic size, about $1.7 trillion. In Sweden, it's only 2%. Swedes don't use much cash, but also it's not an international reserve currency, and drug lords don't use much Swedish krona. You know, and, and, and half of our 1.7 trillion is in $100 bills, and probably most, not all of it, but most of those $100 bills are overseas. Uh, it's great to be the Federal Reserve. That is a zero inter interest rate liability of the Federal Reserve. But there's actually three forms of uh, currency, fiat currency. When you go into Starbucks, you think you're spending this, but you're already spending digital money. And when we go into Starbucks and we spend digital money, we're really spending bank deposits, removing the liability. I, I bank, bank of America. I'm either, either moving my bank deposits of Bank of America to Starbucks Bank of America account, or Starbucks is Chase Manhattan Bank, or, or J.P. Morgan Chase. I'm moving it from my Bank of America account to their Bank of America account, which is really ledger entries, data entries, from one bank account to another bank account, but all liabilities. So you can keep that, because we're going to come back to that in a little bit. All right. You know, it's only a dollar, you know. Um, so, but there's three significant advantages that fiat currency has. And one is it's socially acceptable. Everybody in this room will take a dollar. I bet you if I handed out more of them, you would take them. And those Bitcoin chocolates, you, you're probably not going to do much with them except for eat them, maybe. Or you might keep it as a souvenir. But the three advantages are, number one, it's socially acceptable and people accept it, except for in times of real extreme pain like the late 1940s in China, or in Venezuela right now, uh, or in Germany in the 1930s. When a country loses control of their currency because of lousy fiscal and monetary policy, but other than that, it's socially acceptable. But number two, we embed in law. And since we're at Harvard Law, we embed in law two things to give it a big advantage. One is you can pay your taxes with it. And since normally somewhere between a third and a half of all modern economies or the government, that's a big advantage. And number two, there was another thing that, uh, what was your first name? Emily. Emily, read on there, which was, it's accepted for all debts, public and private. All right, so who's, who's gonna tell me what that means? Under the law, there's a, actually a US law that says that, and then we print it on the currency. What's that? US Constitution. It's not the US Constitution that says that that. But that would be cool if it was constitutional. But what does it mean if it says it's all acceptable for all debts, public and private? Does it mean that Starbucks has to take it if I buy a cup of coffee? Well, they have to. What's that? They have to, if you want to pay for like coffee. Okay, so in fact, they don't have to unless they hand you the cup of coffee. If they hand you the cup of coffee, then you have a debt to Starbucks and you can extinguish that debt with your dollar. Or, well, more than one dollar, actually. Last I was in Starbucks. If they do not hand you the cup of coffee, they do not have to enter into a contract to take the dollar. So always make sure you take the cup of coffee and then argue about it afterwards. <laughs> and and uh, Amazon now has bookstores that will not take US dollars, physical US dollars. I'm waiting for somebody to take them to court. But you have to physically get the book, and they won't hand you the book. So that's what all debts public private. Big, big advantages, it's Bitcoin's got to compete with that. 
So what is blockchain technology? I was told that, that you have some sense of this. There's two really big things. One is it's a data structure. It's a data structure invented in the early 1990s by two scientists at Bell Labs. And those two scientists at Bell Labs were not thinking about currency or money. They were thinking about notaries. You know when you notarize a document and say it's official, it was signed by these people on a certain date, they were thinking, and they, they actually started a company, Surety, a little venture firm in 1995. But they were thinking of a data structure that had blocks of data that were connected like fingerprints. Did my little fingerprints come up? Oh, cool. Um, like fingerprints through a cryptographic primitive called hash functions. And all a hash function is, is a data commitment scheme. You can take all the data in the universe and put it into a cryptographic hash function and get a unique ID for it. You can take the Library of Congress, you can take a picture of me, or a picture of this class, whatever you want. And you get it. So by putting data commitments or data fingerprints on blocks of data and then time stamping them, uh, these two Bell Lab scientists figured out a data structure that some people call immutable. I, I ask you, don't use that word, it's tamper resistant. There is no such thing as an immutable thing in science or in cryptography, it's tamper resistant. And these hash functions have been broken in the past, and then we move to the next harder to break hash function. And even the cryptography inside of Bitcoin will be broken at some point in time, and Satoshi Nakamoto wrote that about that even in 2009 and 2010. And there's great scientists over at MIT like Ron Rivest and others who come up with this stuff, usually math types. The second thing was not invented in the 1990s, was really Nakamoto's innovation, which was how to form the consensus of what the next block of data is. So you have a block of data, a data commitment fingerprint, a block of data fingerprint, block of data fingerprint. The question is, is who gets to write the next block of data? And Nakamoto came up with something using uh, another 1990s invention called proof of work. Uh, a scientist named Adam Beck had this little thing called proof of work. Said, what if we use a computer and the computer has to expend a little bit of energy and a little bit of work to make sure that we don't get email spam? In the middle of Bitcoin was an earlier innovation to protect against email spam. Adam Beck's work in the late 90s was proof of work. Adam Beck, by the way, now is the CEO of Bit. Uh, Bitstream, uh, a blockchain company, he has been successful as compared to those two Bell Lab scientists. So, you know, it's just different folks or different entrepreneurial skills. Um, but Nakamoto said, what if we use a little bit of computer programming work, proof of work, and in a network, solve an old problem, a game theory problem that was written about in the early 80s called the Byzantine generals problem. In essence, if you have multiple generals in Byzantine, and I think the, the computer scientist who wrote the paper in 1981 on this used Byzantine because it was socially acceptable. To, there's, not, there's no real Byzantine generals that had this problem. But there's something in computer science called the Byzantine generals problem, which is basically what if you have multiple generals that have to attack simultaneously on a town, and they send messengers to each other, they all have to attack to be successful. And if any one of them doesn't attack, the five out of the six that do attack are dead. What if you can't trust everybody? What if some of the messages are lost? This was an old computer science game theory issue. Nakamoto solved the Byzantine generals problem through this proof of work concept. I'm glad to take questions on it, but I've got to go on to the law. That's the center of it. The center of it is a data structure blockchain with these data commitments. And secondly, no central authority but consensus among multiple parties. And we get a database. It's boring, kind of back off the stuff. It's like the carburetor. It's a database. That's what it is at the center of all this. The other thing was, was an idea that's about contracts. And so I put it up here. Nick Sabo wrote a paper in the late 90s as well about what if we automate contractual arrangements? 
Now, my dad had a vending machine company, never went to college. Uh, he kind of laughed that I was lecturing in Harvard Law about his vending machines. But, but a smart contract is no different than a physical vending machine. You can put three quarters, or maybe these days more quarters, into a vending machine, and you have a contractual right that that machine, with no human intervention, will give you the pack of gum. You know, you pull the lever. So I think of these two words, smart contracts, maybe because of my youth was hanging around cigarette machines and pinball games, is smart contracts is how do I automate in a computer the same thing as a vending machine? How do I take something that's contractual, conditional right, and move, move something of value, a property right, with no human intervention? <coughs> um, but it's not really something smart. My dad's vending machines were not smart. They didn't have artificial intelligence. And, and then I leave it to you all to figure out whether there's actually contractual rights and whether courts will enforce them. But, but the term smart contract just means automating conditional rights that can move something of, of property value. Um, that's important because uh, we'll get to a lot of dApps. <coughs> Finance. Finance, in a quick word for God, it's been around in 40 years, is basically the movement, the allocation and pricing of two things in the economy. Money, that social construct, you still got my dollar, I got it. Uh, it's moving around money, and it's also risk. And if you think you're going to Wall Street and don't understand risk, learn about risk. And if they're not teaching it to you in the law school, find it somewhere. Find it in the business school. Because finance is about money and risk, allocating, pricing, and moving it around. But it's lived in a symbiotic relationship with tech for 10,000, 20,000 years. <laughs> It's thought that written numbers were before written words, and money itself is a technology. So what are the technologies of now? What are the technologies facing us now? I co-direct something called FinTech at the Computer Science and AI Lab over at MIT, and I will tell you the top left box is most of the donors or funders uh, of, of FinTech at Computer Science and AI Lab are much more interested in the top left box artificial intelligence, machine learning, deep learning, than they are in blockchain. But probably a quarter to a third of our projects are related to blockchain. 50% are probably related to AI, machine learning. Now this is just what they're coming to us with. They're not necessarily coming to us to figure out their next mobile app or open API, but I would argue if you're Barclays Bank, you're much more interested in open API, which means opening up your bank system because the government in England has said you have to open up your bank system. The law is influential there. Uh, you have to open up your APIs. Um, but it's in this context. Blockchain is important and relevant to finance, but it is not the leading thing in FinTech, is what I would say. Um, finance is a fertile ground, particularly for FinTech and for blockchain but mostly because we dematerialized money and securities decades ago. I started on Wall Street in 1979. We still had something called the cage. The cage was where we physically kept stock certificates. That word still exists, but it's, it, nobody's keeping physical stock certificates in a cage. Um, and we've dematerialized money, largely. I mean, you still have this chocolate, there's the $1 bill over there, right? So it's very fertile ground uh, for uh, everything. Now, before we get into the, the, the law, I want to say that finance, the financial sector and incumbents are not really that interested in Bitcoin. It's a $175 billion asset class, but they're still using traditional databases. Traditional databases, by and large, are more efficient. They're not going to this block, data commitment block, data commitment block, data commitment. And if they are, they're using what's called permission blockchain. A permission blockchain says, I am not going to let this live out in the wild. Um, uh, I'm not going to let it live out in the wild like Bitcoin. I mean, Bitcoin has survived 10 years fundamentally in the swamp. With, when I say swamp, I say that in an affectionate, uh, you know, caring way. I mean, it has lived out. And, and, and so many different people have tried to take it down and, and corrupt it, attack it, and it hasn't 
by and large, been taken down. State actors have tried. Uh, commercial actors have tried. Just, you know, let's have some fun. Let's see if we can take it down, kind of computer scientists have tried. Um, but most of finance doesn't want to have something out in the wild. They want a permission blockchain, which means I'm going to have a separate number of permission people writing to the network. And then lastly, public blockchains. And you'll see, hear this term, public versus private, or private versus public uh, blockchain. All the action in traditional finance is on the left. And when you read about IBM Hyperledger, you read about other things, it's in the middle. But if you go to work at a law firm and you're advising, you might be all the way on the right hand <laughs> side um, on this. And here are some of the use cases or some of the areas that are use cases. In finance, the biggest thing has been crowdfunding. And we're going to talk just for a moment about initial coin offerings, but it's been 25 to $30 billion that's been raised. And I am glad to share my slides with Elizabeth. I'll put them in a Dropbox, and if anybody wants them, you, the public source. I think they're recording this, too. You, you, you can take pictures, too. I'm tweeting. What's that? I'm you're, tweeting. You're tweeting. Wow. <laughs> Barry Denser tweeted. I don't think you're going to have a lot of followers, but all right. <laughs> my girlfriend might look at it. I don't know. Um, so um, uh, the main use cases so far has been as a form of crowdfunding that we're going to talk about. And then there's a little bit of nibbles in the payment system place. Most of these are proofs of concept. There's five big projects in trade finance that I could talk about, but they're all permission, not open source and permissionless public systems. So it's still kind of new in this area. Um, Non-finance. I think there's going to be a lot that could be interesting about self-sovereign identity. And you know, what's the word privacy mean but ownership of our, uh, our data? And you can use blockchain technology to form a better tamper resistance or control of one's data. You can. The question is whether it will be commercially feasible to do so. Facebook was not going to lose this battle easily. Nor is any of the big tech companies that basically commercialize our data for their benefit. But blockchain technology could be part of an evolution of whether we as individuals control our data. Uh, it's not the only way we as individuals can control our data, but it is one way that we could control it. So I think that's kind of the, the digital ID area to me is, is one of the more interesting possibilities, but I wouldn't get too excited too early. Um, there's two trade-offs. There's centralization versus decentralization. Uh, Coase wrote about this in the 1930s. He was a famous economist. Um, there's a cost of centralization. It's usually about single points of failure, uh, when you get really highly centralized, you get to mon monopolies and you collect economic rents. You get kind of stodgy like a lot of central banks are right now and some commercial banks. The U.S. financial system takes 7.5% of our economy. That's $1.5 trillion a year. That's a lot of juice. It's why some of you are going to work in finance. I worked in finance for 18 years and it was terrific. It was terrific. And I actually, it was terrific for lots of reasons because it was great colleagues, great clients but it also paid a lot. Um, some of that creates economic rents. Uh, and, and, and not disparaging what I did, I don't know anything like that, but I didn't really earn what I got paid. I got paid a lot more. Uh, it's the nature of our lopsided economy uh, and system. Um, but there's also cost of decentralization. And the Bitcoin purist, the Bitcoin maximalist, if I might say, would say this is about decentralization and a really important thing is decentralization. And I would say, yes, but let's take Uber. You could create Uber on a blockchain technology. I have no doubt that you, we could do it. We could take a couple of computer scientists uh, from the Digital Currency Initiative over where I am, probably a couple of good lawyers from Harvard Law, and we could create Uber on a blockchain between customers and riders and so forth. But you still have the question of who's going to put the effort in to negotiate with each town and each locality to get Uber into London and into Paris and into you know, every town. Uh, who's going to sort of 
update the software. So, so there's trade-offs. I think that orange line, the slope of the orange line will come down in five or 10 years. I think we're really at the early days of, of blockchain technology and Bitcoin, but we will never, we will never get it to be flat. There's still going to be a trade-off where decentralization ain't easy. Um, so now we get to crypto finance. This, this asset class is $175 billion as of a few hours ago. If I were to talk to you two weeks ago, it would have been $120 billion, and as you can see, it's got some volatility in it. A little over half of it's Bitcoin. I like to think of it in four or five sectors, but subsectors, because I was at Goldman Sachs for all those years, so you think of asset classes. Their payment tokens is about two-thirds of the overall. Two-thirds with, of course, Bitcoin being about 90 billion out of 175. Um, then there's these protocol platforms like Ethereum. Vitalik Buterin created Ethereum to say, Let's create something that you can build applications on top of. So in a sense, think of the operating system, the iOS that's in your cell phone. Think of the uh, operating system in your laptop. These protocol layers are about 20% of the asset class, 30, 35 billion of the total, with Ethereum being the, 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 the big one. There's, there's five or six others that remarkably, some of them are $5 billion of value or $3 billion of value and $2 billion of value in the market. They're not going to all succeed. And then on top of these protocol layers, there's decentralized applications, just like the apps that we all download onto our phones. And you can build decentralized applications on top of a blockchain technology. The question is, will anybody use them? But this is how the asset classes are now. The dApps, about 10%. There's also stable value tokens, which means let's just custody an asset underneath it. Custody, dollars, yen, Swiss franc, oil, gold underneath it. Um, so crypto exchanges. There's about 200 crypto exchanges. I can't tell you how many of them are real. Probably 150 to more of them are, are really fakes and frauds. Uh, you don't take my word on it, Bitwise just did a wonderful application into the SEC in March. Bit, Bitwise is, a, a, again, if you go working for a big law firm, you could be working on a Bitwise application. Bitwise is applying to the Securities and Exchange Commission to do an exchange traded fund. And under Jay Clayton's leadership, the SEC has denied every application for exchange traded funds. And Jay and the team there might be right. Because he's saying, underneath this market, I'm not comfortable whether it's easily manipulatable. So Bitwise comes along and puts in a 180-page application. And it's under review right now. So they're trying to be that first person to get over the line and get an ETF when the Winkleboss twins, they went to Harvard, didn't they? Yeah, I think so. Uh, the Winkleboss twins have applied not once, I don't think twice, but three times have been denied. They have a firm called Gemini. Um, and they've been denied their exchange trade fund. If you're really deep down the rabbit hole, go read the Bitwise application. By the way, it's, it's easy to read. It's a slide deck. One page of writing, and the rest is a slide deck. Um, but they would say only 4.5% of the volume on crypto exchanges is, re is real volume, and the other 95% is fake. It's wash trades, and it's just pr promoted to build the efforts. Um, how many of you have ever owned a cryptocurrency? Other than the chocolate in your pocket. Okay, about half. How many of you have done that with your own private key? One, two, okay, three, all right. I'm at Harvard, not MIT. At, at MIT, more people would have their own private keys, but it's never more than half even at MIT. So about 40% of you have owned a cryptocurrency, which is let's say 30 of you, and only three of you have had your own private key, meaning the other 27 or so have done it on a crypto exchange. You're trusting their custody. What's that? I'll put the private key. Yeah, sorry, I misunderstood. All right, you've done it with your own private key. You've downloaded you, a wallet and you hold it. Don't trust the exchange, that's correct. You don't trust the exchange. But most people trust the exchange to hold their asset. 
If you trade on the New York Stock Exchange or the London Stock Exchange, it's a little different. You're trusting a whole regulatory regime, but you're also trusting something embedded in U.S. law that all the custody is ultimately at something called the Depository Trust Corporation, DTCC, or in other countries, similar mechanisms. So we have a central banking system for cash, the, the dematerialized thing called money. And then we have these central clearing houses to hold what some people call the golden record of securities. But here, the golden record, the legal property right is held on a technology called blockchain technology. And you're trusting in the crypto exchanges to hold what's called your private key. Or you can think of your password if you wish to use that word. Um, the right for scam and fraud, none of them, none of them are registered with the Securities and Exchange Commission at this point in time. Um, and as I said, 95% uh, of the market goes here. So this is the reported monthly trading volume. Uh, crypto Compare puts up a monthly chart. It's not hard to find. This is the reported volume. And I'm going to tell you, ignore it. Most of it's not real. This is from Bitwise's uh, application a few weeks ago. You'll see Binance, 110 million a day, is about 3 billion a, a month. And if you went back uh, uh, a chart, these are all like 10 and 15 billion a month. They just make up their numbers. They just make it up. Because <laughs> it's good marketing and it doesn't, uh, well, nobody's been sent to jail yet. Um, and even here in the U.S., many of the exchanges, even on this page, Poloniex is run by and owned by a company here in Boston called Circle. Circle slash um, Goldman Sachs. <laughs> there you go, Jeremy Allier and, and Sean uh, Newell. But Coinbase, Poloniex, Gemini, Kraken are all U.S. They're not registered with the SEC either. And they probably should be. So right now, we're living in a world where there's both regulatory uncertainty and regulatory forbearance, which is not usually something you would hear about in law school, but it, it, it goes to the point. Um, ICOs. This fella never got rich, but I like putting him in some of my talks because I just think, wow, isn't this neat? Audacious as it was, he convinced his wife he was going to buy $300 of Bitcoin back in 2011 or 2012. And he went around marketing. He said, somebody should figure out how to make Bitcoin an application layer, uh, I mean, an operating protocol layer like your computer system, your iOS, and put applications on top of Bitcoin. Nobody would give him the time of day. He said, but you can raise money off of this. And he wrote a paper in 2012, which is literally the first paper promoting this concept, crowdfunding on top of a blockchain and not use Kickstarter, not go, go start me, but crowdfund on top of a blockchain, uh, J.R. Willett. And he never got rich, and he started something that became Omnicoin, and Omnicoin has a total market value of $2 million right now. Um, he wasn't Vitalik Buterin, he didn't, so he, but he's, he's kind of the inspiration. Now, what are initial coin offerings? Initial coin offerings are a way to raise money before you have an application. And they basically are used to build networks before the network is functional, and the purchasers are absolutely buying it for price appreciation. Why do I know that? 97 or 98% of these have been done before you can use the token for anything of value. So economics will tell you if you're buying something that can't be used, you're going to buy it at a discount. You have to anticipate in equilibrium that it will appreciate. And thus, this gets caught up in securities law. In the US, particularly, but also in Canada and Taiwan. You might say, why Taiwan? Because Taiwan in the year 2011 adopted the US approach to this. Um, and uh, Ernst and Young did a study a year, uh, six months ago, and said, well, what happened to all the ICOs from 2017? And these are the statistics. About two-thirds of them had failed. 
uh, 86% were trading down, or two-thirds down, and only 13% even had a working product 10 months later. Um, but it's not dead. The first quarter of 19, 300 million a month was, was raised. It's not like it was. Crypto winter is supposedly here, but 100, 100 of these were done a month, raising not a big amount of money, and you're not going to create a legal career on this stuff any longer, but it's still going away. Or maybe you will. I don't know. I don't want to speak for your Public policy things. <laughs> I've had the honor to be speaking at different conferences around the globe and with uh, the OECD and the Bank of International Settlement, so in other places. This is my summary of it. Three big slips for you. How do we guard against illicit activity? How do we protect for financial stability? How do we uh, protect investors? Um, so guarding against illicit activities. The challenge is, is that this all came out of a kind of libertarian cypherpunk world. And it still has that ethos, but also the technology itself doesn't have Gary Gensler's name on it, my social security or passport number. It has a long Bitcoin address, or if it's one of the other coins, it has some other public key, private key, pseudonymous, and I can never pronounce the word. That's why I didn't get into Harvard. Uh, but that's the problem. And so then regulators around the globe are kind of fussy about this. And they should be. They want to make sure that the tax base doesn't shrink and that we don't promote bad things, whether it's drug running or other things. And so it's how does it fit into the Bank Secrecy Act laws. Here in the US, by 2011, 2012, and then finalized in 2013, the US Department of Treasury, through the Financial Crimes Enforcement Network, said, this is under the Bank Secrecy Act. You have to keep any money laundering and counterterrorism finance and all this sort of requisite stuff around that. Of 180, 190 countries around the globe, pretty much all of them agree with that. But many of them are doing a lousy job tracking it. And it's not that hard to get around it if you want to trade on what's called a crypto-to-crypto -crypto exchange. The on-ramps and off-ramps for official enforcement here is the bank network. It's when you go from crypto to fiat. How do some people avoid that? Sometimes they even avoid it with thumb, exchanging thumb drives for bags of currency, back to the $1 bill. And there's places where, where criminals are doing drops between suitcases of cash and thumb drives. Um, but, so that's one of the challenges. Lots of uniform agreement, but tons of challenges. Um, financial stability. I put up a bunch of things here because I recently talked a financial stability board forum on this stuff. Most central bankers aren't terribly worried. At $180 billion, it's a small asset class. The worldwide equity market's about $90 trillion. And the worldwide debt and bond markets are two to $300 trillion. So kind of, it's small. But they are looking at it closely. Central bankers around the globe say, well, if you put a lot of leverage in here, or if, or if the financial sector uses this blockchain technology, what's its governance, what's its cybersecurity, what's its privacy, all the kind of words that I put up here. But what the central bankers are really interested in is they've started to say, hey, there's this private sector new money. How do we react? And Canada and Singapore are the furthest along in various projects called Project Jasper and Project Ubin, where they're saying maybe we can use blockchain technology to update our payment system. And the challenge for central bankers are that their payment systems, the ones we all use, we're, we're all customers of central bank payment systems, is that they're only open about eight or nine or 10 hours a day, five days a week. And they're kind of yesterday's technology. I mean, they're not 30-year-ago technology, but they're kind of 10 and 20-year-ago technology. And so this new private form of money, Bitcoin, is pressing at, at, at its ankles, nipping at its ankles. Um, most central banks don't like that. The second thing they're looking at is, well, should we give a tokenized representation of money? Like when this, I mean, I'm going to get that dollar back later, but when this, when this goes away, 
when this goes away, and I will contend for anybody in here who's a Harvard Law student, your children won't recognize this stuff. And your grandchildren will surely not recognize this stuff. They won't use it. It's going the way of the dodo bird. We've already digitized our rent payments, our pay, our coffee. How many people in here today have used physical cash? It's about 6 o'clock. Right? No, oops, you haven't. So wait, wait, how many was it? Fewer than the number of people that have bought crypto. Now, you didn't buy crypto today. I know, it's not a, a fair comparison, right? And how many people have written a check, written a physical check in the last week? It's tax time. Come on, some of you have. I did. It was tax time. But I wrote a physical check because it was tax time. Right? So we're, we're dematerializing all this right now. So the central banks are looking at it. I've listed a bunch of countries that are looking at it. Should they tokenize money that's available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, not built on a blockchain technology we've done? Um, then there's investor protection. The countries around the globe are all over the lot about this. They're just completely all over the lot about it. But let's go to the US and have some fun. The Howey test. Anybody, do they teach the Howey test in law school? What is it? Um, it's how to determine whether it's a security. All right, how to determine if something is a security. But actually, it's how to determine if something is an investment contract. Because in the early 1930s, when the securities laws were passed, our Congress decided to put a list in the black letter law. And having personally worked on a few laws, those debates sometimes have consequences. Well, that debate in 1933, when they put equity, comma, bond, comma, option, comma, investment contract, had consequences 13 years later when an orange grove in Florida by one said, Mr. Howie, the question was they were selling land. Selling land and the purchasers of the land could then contract with an affiliated company to grow oranges on it. And the question was, is that investment contract and thus a security under the securities law? And the US Supreme Court in 1946 said yes, that was an investment contract that was part of what Congress's intent was in the 1930s. And it's been upheld at the Supreme Court three or four times as recently as about 10 years ago. So it's kind of settled law for 70 years. And this is a four-part test. Sometimes people call this a three-part test. Um, because they put, the, the first is easy as investment in money or assets. Is it in a common enterprise and expect, expectation of profits on the efforts of promoters or others? I think that 99% of initial coin offerings pass this test. And by the way, if you're advising somebody, you do not want to pass it, you want to fail this test. But if you pass this test, you are an investment contract, you are a security, you're under the U.S. securities laws. But you don't need to take my word for it. Jay Clayton has said this a few times in front of congressional hearings. And a week or two ago, the SEC gave their first no action letter. Does anybody know what a no action letter is? I never knew what a no action letter was when I was at Goldman Sachs, by the way. And if I went to Harvard Law, I probably wouldn't know what it is either. But when I was at the chair of a commission, I knew what a no action letter is because the lobbyists and the lawyers are always coming in and saying, we just want to do this activity, but we want to make sure we don't think it's under the commodities law or securities law, but could you confirm it's not, and could you issue us this letter, that you will take no action to enforce the securities or commodities laws. In fact, if you go into regulatory practices at any law firm, you will be in the no action business, it's a mother may I business where you walk into a regulator, you explain your client's business, you kind of say, I don't think it comes under the communications law or the securities law, but I'd like you to confirm that. And you get what's called a no action letter. It's regulatory discretion. It's a regulator saying, we are choosing not to lean in and enforce this bit of the law. We're going to lean back. And uh, I don't know, I got to the uh, CFTC, there were six or 700 no action letters that had existed, and I committed in my confirmation process that we'd make them all public. That upset a few people, actually. Um, and in my time there, we probably issued another 100 to 200. Um, 
them. So it's a big, it's a big thing. But they issued a no action letter. For the first one, it was a stable value token. It was a custody token on fiat currency. I don't think the SEC is going to let many ICOs off the hook. I think they're going to scare the market and force the market, try to bring it into compliance. Um, these are the, the cases they've brought so far, or actions they've brought so far. But there's two or 3,000 ICOs that have happened. There's not enough enforcement staff to do more. But you, know, you keep bringing these things, and it's slowly kind of bringing the market into compliance. Um, Crypto exchanges lose a lot of money. It gets stolen. These private keys get stolen. This is another issue, custody. Custody is a very tough issue the SEC is grappling with right now as to how can crypto exchanges get relevant, important custody. I think over the next 18 months, you will see numerous of the exchanges, the Krakens and Coinbases and Geminis, Poloniexes, try to register as a broker-dealer under regulation alternative trading system, ATS. Um, why is that relevant? Well, then they'll be inside the regulatory perimeter and rather than outside the regulatory perimeter. I would guess that the SEC would rather than fully comply with regulation ATS, which was, came out of the internet age. It was published in 1998. It took three years to figure out what to do under uh, Chairman Levitt's term in the Clinton years. Um, but I, I think that the problem is, is none of these crypto exchanges can fully comply with regulation ATS. So they've got to negotiate with the SEC. And as I've said to some, uh, some exchanges, I'm not paid by any, I've said, listen, figure out what you can do, figure out what you can't do, figure out what's hard to do. And you've got to go into the SEC and say, that which I can't do, I need a no action letter. I mean, I don't have to do it. That which is hard to do, give me 18 months to do it. That which I can do, do. But the SEC is in probably, um, if I had to speculate, negotiation with all these exchanges, trying to see which one will come into compliance uh, first. Um, but I, I like this test the best. It's better than the Howey test. We used it often at the CFTC. It quacks like a duck. It waddles like a duck. It talks like a duck. It's a security. Um, <laughs> I didn't make it up. A poet made it up over 100 years ago, but you hear it when you're in Washington. The lobbyist leaves the room and somebody says, duck test. You know, it's just a shorthand. So when you're representing a client, even if they want to get between the wallpaper and the wall and just get in that little sliver of ambiguity, when they leave the room, say to your colleague, wait, wait, let's just use duck test. Use common sense. And then call your client back up and say, wait, I just tell you, I'm going to be your advocate. I'm going to fight hard for you. But this is this, you know, we, we should have a, you know, kind of a little ground truth discussion. Um, and the best lawyers that came in when I was chairing a commission kind of had those conversations with the client. They still advocated. They still asked for some things that you would just think were crazy. But they at least the clients kind of knew they were it's a negotiation. Um, and that there's still the spirit of the law that's underneath it. Um, I said about hype cycles, and I'm going to close on this in the next chart. This is the Gartner hype cycle. Any technology goes through it. Railroads did, television did, internet did. It's like, you know, you get enthusiastic, it comes down, it comes back. Where are we here? I think we've been through three hype cycles. We had the altcoin cycle in 2013. We had the crowdfunding cycle. And if I'm hitting this right, I think we're into a, something called security token cycle now, or tokenization. And remarkably, these are all the token projects going on. And one of my favorites is NASDAQ is contracted with the Estonian Stock Exchange <laughs> to tokenize US listed securities and offer them around the globe out of <coughs> Tallinn. That bastion of financial you know, activity. I mean, I love Estonia because, of course, that's where Skype came from. Um, and transfer-wise, I mean, it's a great entrepreneurial country. But really, tokenizing US securities in, out of Estonia? Um, so I think this is our next hype cycle in this. I, I don't think there's enough there, there, 
But their argument is, is you could buy this stuff 24 hours a day, seven days a week, the US securities markets and the US clearinghouses and the US payment systems aren't open 24 seven. JP Morgan has JP Morgan coin, 15 major banks have something they're trying to do around the settlement coin. Uh, so it's kind of a really interesting catalyst that's happened here. Um, Conclusions, finance has been symbiotic with, with um, technology forever. Um, and we dematerialized money a long time ago, before many of you were probably born. Um, I think that there's plenty of scams to go around. And if you go into this space, just know it's like a swampy area. And we don't have any of the crypto exchanges regulated yet. I've contended to Congress, we've got to at least bring the crypto exchanges inside the regulatory perimeter rather than leaving them out. Give them the SEC or CFTC, it's not about turf, just bring them in. Um, uh, but it's not there yet. Most ICOs are probably non-compliant, meaning breaking the law. Um, but there's some regulatory forbearance right now going on. Um, I think that adoption rests on real viability. Do you need an append-only law? Do you need this data structure? It's three things. Do you really need the data structure? Do you need multi-party consensus, meaning multiple parties writing to this ledger? And thirdly, do you need a native, unique token? You might like the data structure, but if you don't need this token, just do a permission blockchain. Um, but uh, though a lot's gonna masquerade as fact, a lot of hype will masquerade as fact, this has already been a catalyst for change. So I'm not, I don't want to be remembered as a minimalist here. I'm kind of in the middle. I'm not with Tim Draper, who you heard from last night. I interviewed Tim last summer. And I mean, did, for those of you who watched, did he have his Bitcoin tie on? No. No, he didn't have his Bitcoin tie on? When I interviewed him, we had Bitcoin socks and Bitcoin tie. And he's, he's wonderfully successful. He's wonderfully enthusiastic. I just don't think it's going to go the path he thinks of replacing fiat currency. I think fiat currency has a place because you can pay your taxes and it's all debts public and private and all that. But I also don't, I'm not such a minimalist. I'm not over there with Norio Rabini or Paul Krugman or Joe Stiglitz and so forth who say, ah, oh, this is nothing. No, I think, there's a, I think this is a catalyst for change. I think this data structure and potentially in some places an extremist, maybe Venezuela or some other country in the future will say, we'll just put this on a computer code. Um, so I ran a little bit over, and I didn't do your, whatever you want to do here. So I should have, I should have broken over. All right, two questions I'm told. So here, one here, one here. And maybe a third one. Um, excellent presentation, Gary. Um, what do you should suggest based on your experience and theory and practice when it comes to someone who's interested in being the best program in the world? The as best what in the world? Program in the world. Best program in the world. As far as the theory and practice on all these means. All right, best program in the world. What's your question? Because I'm going to do so, two of them. What yeah. are your views on uh, proof of proof of stake as a as a as an evolution from uh, proof of uh, work? Because the idea. All right, so two technology questions. Is there any non-technology question yes. here? How did Hillary Clinton, what am I doing um, for Hillary? I was her chief financial officer. Exactly. I love her. Um, I mean, I voted for her. I did too. You know, I, I worked on her LA campaign. And then, um, because I was never Trump, so I'm, I'm still never Trump. Um, you know how there'll be a lot of money going to happy politics as usual. Right. Can you uh, right. provide your experience? Like, All right, so experience of politics. Let me do the te technology. two technology questions. I think that the technology, we're still like in the 1980s on the internet. I think that money, 30 plus billion dollars got thrown at this early, this crowdfunding craze. Um, but the performance isn't there. Bitcoin does about a transaction every, uh, or seven or 10 transactions a second. Visa is 25,000 transactions a second. And DTCC needs to be shock tested for 100,000 transactions a second. But I do think that five to 10 years from now, we'll be through all the performance issues. And the question about proof of stake or proof of work relates to that. Um, Nakamoto san used proof of work, this atom back technology where the computers have to use a lot of electricity and, and build something with a little risk and a little uh, work in it. 
Proof of stake, about 10% of the $180 billion market is proof of stake coins now. Proof of stake as well, can we move away from using a lot of computer energy, like we're mining for gold, and, and do it more efficiently? Less electricity and also quicker. I don't know if proof of stake will be the solution, but I think it's part of the answer to the first question that we've got to get better performance and still say decentralized. And that the risk is to get the performance, you tend towards centralization. And proof of stake has some of those risks uh, on those technological questions. The, the politics, what is your, what's your central question? Like, um, how did the allocation process... How, how does what? How did the allocation process went in 2016? Because it seems to me that there will be a lot of money flowing into 2020 presidential election. Uh, so, I mean... Uh, well, it's not, it's not that hard to... Based on your experiences, it, yeah, yeah. It's all right. and, and So I was a chief financial officer. It's, it's a challenging job like no other thing. It's a startup. You never know when you're going to end. There's now 15 or 20 Democratic candidates, and they all have to plan for ending shortly after Iowa or even before uh, in a Republican similar thing in the off year in, in 2015. Uh, wasn't it? Uh, Governor Walker didn't even make it to Iowa. So you don't know as a financial model how long you're going to last and you can't be assured of your revenue. In the Hillary situation, we stood up over 500 offices over that period of time. We raised and spent a billion dollars. We hired and let go over 5,000 people. And we have to land, as I would say, to to Hillary and to Robbie Mook, the campaign manager, I said, where do you want to land this? But I'm planning to land this with no fuel in the tank. So on election day, the goal was to have no money, zero, or a few hundred thousand. And uh, you, didn't want to, you didn't want to land the plane with 10 or 20 million, and we didn't want to run out beforehand. So it's a really interesting sort of finance set of questions. Uh, and allocation, you ask, it's not that really uh, uh, that confusing. Um, there's one metric in politics, ultimately, is the polling and the public, and ultimately the votes and the caucuses. Um, and so it's how you connect to voters, uh, what money is spent to connect to voters, get the message out, the candidate's message out. Um, uh, that connects to voters, but ultimately it's it's about getting your more of your voters to the polls than somebody else. I mean, oversimplifying in, in this moment, even though we're talking about blockchain technology. Um, should I wrap it up? Yeah. Thank you so much.